How many engineers are in the room? Raise your hand. Well, us engineers, we're not any smarter than you. I've been through a lot of classes. I've been through thermodynamics. I've been through all the calculus classes, physics classes. And the hardest class I had was comms 101, public speaking. So <laughs> those comms majors are ruthless. There was uh, one project where we came in ready for a speech and the professor would write down two words on two pieces of paper. And we had to revolve the 10 minute speech around that. And I fully went blank mid speech and all the comms majors just blew me out of the, out of the way. So bear with me. Public speaking is not my thing, but I did lock myself in a room for two years investing in land. So I think I know what I'm talking about. So today I'll be talking about engineering growth in your land business. I have a background in industrial engineering, which is basically revolved around manufacturing and assembly lines. And I'll get into that in the next slide. So my name is Rylan Loader. If you don't know me already, my business is Coyote Land Holdings. I started it back in 2020. And I also co-founded Land Insights alongside Sumner. And I'm also a LEA coach. My background is in industrial engineering, where I primarily focused in process improvement, we did a lot of manufacturing, a lot of factory improvements. And I spent some time working at Raytheon Missiles and Defense, literally making missiles. It was, it was interesting. You'd go into the factory and there'd be just explosives everywhere. And they'd, they literally bur they, they built berms around the, the factories in case something blew up. They wouldn't blow anything else up. So it made me a little concerned. I thought if I stayed there any longer, I might blow up myself. So I need to get out of that business. <laughs> um, so my background's in process improvement. So I brought a lot of interesting topics to the land business and I ultimately turned it into an assembly line and kind of passed off everything and removed myself from that business so that I could scale up, scale marketing and build a team around it. So Today, I'm going to be talking about how in 2023, I went from 25,000 a month to over 100,000 a month. I'm going to talk about the timeline. I'm going to talk about my approach, my mentality, and how you guys can do the same. And I'm also going to back it by data. So this is the timeline right here. In January, I had one employee. I was working eight hour days. I was working every day of the week and I was stressed, but money was good but I knew I could do something better. I've seen a lot of different um, business processes and the land business is freaking simple. I was working on a missile program where we'd bring in explosives from different parts of the country. We'd bring in rocket motors. We'd have engineering costs. We'd have a bunch of capital expenses for the equipment we needed to manufacture and it was just chaos. So coming into the land business, it's simple. And you guys can easily scale this with just a few hires. So I don't understand why not everybody else is aiming for $100,000 a month. It's, it's pretty simple to do if you break it down and turn it into a system. So in February, I kind of went in my montage moment. Every time I grow my assembly line, I think of like an Iron Man montage. Like the da 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 So <laughs> I systematized my business, hired two employees, got myself entirely off the phones, remove myself from most parts of the business and train them all the way up until August. It was tough, but I had three employees that were high performers and they were working really well. So ultimately I was bring, I brought my business back down to like one to two hours a day for myself. And we were doing about 60,000 a month. So that was pretty crazy. So I decided to go to Europe for a month. I also spent some time at home working one to two hours a day and, you know, just, backpacking across Europe, but just a computer in my backpack. So it was a good feeling, but I knew I could do more. I knew I could double it again. So I went back to Florida where I'm at and just locked myself in a room again, went through the Ironman montage. And now we're doing over a hundred thousand dollars a month. We've got six employees and I'm going to try to do $2 million next year, just flipping land alone. So a question I want you guys to ask yourself is, is why am I not continuously scaling my business? I'd assume most people in this room are making over $8,000 a month, which already tops most W2 salaries. If you guys have already proved the system to yourself, if you prove flipping to yourself, why aren't you just scaling it? It's, it's simple. The, the turnaround on investments about 
five to six months. Like if you can do one deal, you can do multiple deals. Not like every deal kind of follows the same, the same line of assembly. So let's break it up. What really made this business click for me was when I broke it up into an assembly line. You got to think of it as like making a pair of shoes. It's, it's simple. You have your deal flow. So you start with market selection. You extract your data, you price your offers, you send out that mail, you wait for leads to come in, you aggregate those leads, you convert the leads to sales, you have acquisition and you have disposition. Every deal, whether that be a $3,000 deal or a $500,000 deal, as long as it's a flip, it's gonna follow that same process. So if you can dial in one deal, you can dial in 50 deals. So you really need to break it into an assembly line. And there's two catalysts for growth in the business. So once you have your assembly line figured out, there's two catalysts. And your main catalyst is your marketing. So if you're not hitting your marketing numbers, nothing's gonna go through that assembly line. So your marketing is the qu quantity uh, of mail, text calls, et cetera. And then you need to have a team to support that marketing. So basically you have your product going through the assembly line, and then you have the capacity to handle that product in your assembly line. So you need to build an assembly line around that. And what's crazy about this business is your results are predictable. Whether you're starting out in the business or you've been in the business for two years, your results are predictable. You can determine how much money you're gonna make and you can determine how much you're gonna invest in land. So why aren't we just scaling up? It's, it's easy to predict these results. I've seen several KPIs and all these KPIs revolve around the KPIs that I'm gonna show you in my land business. So the top row I'm showing here, the 1,943 letters sent, that's how many letters it takes for me to get one deal. And this is since I started the land business. My average profit for de per deal is $10,367. And what I did when I started scaling up my business was I wrote that down and then I assumed all efficiency remained constant. I assumed that I could handle these leads the same way I could at a higher scale and I broke up those numbers. So I created a list for you guys. If you guys send 5,000 letters, you can expect 2.6 deals, $26,000 profit. And the list goes on. So right now we're, we're kind of in the middle of 10 to 20,000. So we're around $75,000 profit uh, with our mailer. So we're doing 15,000 mailers a month. Oh. Now, a lot of people haven't seen KPIs for texting. These are my KPIs since I started texting. Right now we're sending 65,000 texts a month, which is absurd. <laughs> it's a lot. So since I started, I started probably like eight months ago texting, takes um, 10,000 texts to get 1.75 deals. I forgot how I arrived at that, but <laughs> that's the number we got to. Average deal profit was 9,247. It's a little lower because we started implementing double closes and some of them worked out, some of them didn't. We'll still do it if we're gonna make like four grand, but we ideally don't wanna do that. So our profit went down a little bit because we, we took on more deals than we usually do. So I broke that down again, and um, we're kind of in, in the middle of that 5,100,000 text text sent. So we're bringing in a lot of uh, deal profit from texting. So I have sort of a hybrid approach right now. Um, we're doing 15,000 mailers, 10,000 are to new people, 5,000 are follow-up, and then we're doing 40,000 new texts and 15,000 uh, repeat texts. So at the end of the day, we need 40,000 new ownership records a month. And that was quite a hurdle to work through to like remain <laughs> efficient with our market selection. So that, that's something I'll talk about today. But with that, we're seeing about $140,000 in deal profit. And that's just because we're not efficient right now. There's a couple problems we've encountered just because some deals have slipped through the cracks. Um, but I'm hoping to up that to be 100% efficient and expect 180,000 deal profit from this hybrid approach. So this is my team that handles this. We're slim, like it's, it's pretty crazy that you can handle that scale with this team. I've just built the systems in place to handle that. You need to be extremely organized. You need to have your SOPs in place. You need to have your CRMs in place. You need zaps. So I was able to get it efficient and I'm at 
uh, six people on my team and this is $5,003 a month. So we have our data guy. I am extremely bullish on removing um, bad properties from your data set before you contact anyone. I hate stuff coming through my pipeline that's landlocked. So I front end that and just remove it. I have a guy that works $2 an hour around the clock. <laughs> Well, you have to think about it as like a, a, a guy that works in a factory in the Philippines. Like, would you rather work from home or would you rather work from a factory? So, sorry. <laughs> so that's our data guy. He removes everything bad. So he removes flood zones. He removes uh, landlocked stuff. He removes stuff that's sloped if he can notice it. And then he, he sends the data set to us. We send out our marketing and then we have three people on our acquisitions team. We've got an acquisitions manager who closes the deals, does most of the negotiations. He has an assistant. This assistant does like preliminary phone calls. So if somebody comes in from Pat Live, uh, they don't seem like a hot lead. This assistant will like call them and then push them through our CRM to build them up to a hot lead. Uh, this assistant also like manages the full-time acquisition managers like calls. So they manage the CRM pretty well. And then we have our texting manager, they're full time texting around the clock. We're thinking we might need to bring on another part time just because that's a lot of text to handle 65,000 is a lot. And she's working six days a week. So she's stressed out and I want to help her out. So we're going to bring on another person part time. And then for dispositions, we have this part time realtor outreach person. So if you guys have seen some of me and Michael's responses in the Discord, we'll tell you, reach out to a realtor. We don't know every deal. We don't know what it's all worth. So we don't have the crystal ball. So reaching out to local people is extremely beneficial, especially if you're doing a double close or if you just don't know that market. So we have somebody that works part time and reaches out to realtors and, and comps our properties. And then we have my favorite hire, my mother. <laughs> who is the escrow realtor manager. She sends my money. She signs all the contracts. She's great. Um, I pay her a little more than, than what's up here. <laughs> she does well. But if, if you guys have a mom that's very organized, I recommend you reach out to her. She's, they're great. Moms are great. She's, she's, she's really helped me out. But uh, as, as far as dispositions and acquisitions go, I don't see anything. I'll get offers on properties I don't even know we had. So basically my, my role in the business right now is figure out the markets we're going after and then decide on whether or not we'll go after a deal. And that's it. Everything else is, is pretty much handled. So I've remo re removed myself from most of the assembly line. So scaling's not easy. It leads to bottlenecks. And pretty much every single part of the assembly line will suffer as you scale. The way I like to handle scaling is just increase your marketing and then build your team around it. It's not that hard to make a quick hire and handle it. I recommend you just top max out your marketing and then handle it once you run into the issues. It becomes more urgent at that point. So I'm going back to the assembly line and I'm gonna run through each part of the assembly line and tell you how I fixed it. So the two biggest issues when you increase your marketing is market selection and converting leads to sales. Everything else is, is pretty easy to fix. So I'll jump into market selection and converting leads to sales in a couple other slides, but I'll run through the rest quickly right here and, and how I solved it. So data extraction, you need to just hire a VA to handle that. You can get them cheap $2 an hour. Sad. <laughs> uh, they, they build out lists. You can build automations to help you sort through your data in Excel and Google Sheets. So it's, it's easy to handle that. Pricing offers is a little bit more of an art as you spend more time in the business. Um, you'll get better at your blind offers, but at the scale I'm at, I can't do blind offers. So I mostly do ranges or neutral letters. It's just, it's not physically possible to, to be pricing out blind offers at that scale. So it's either range or neutral, and then our team will review it and uh, comp that deal. Aggregating leads, simple, just get Pat Live, zap it to your CRM, keep it organized. Make sure you have that zap, otherwise stuff is gonna get lost. So I, I really like zap. I implemented that like three months ago, and I don't know why I didn't do it before. 
Converting lead to sales. We'll get into that on the next slide. Acquisition and disposition. Guys, stop listing stuff on your own. Don't do MLS for sale by owner. When you're scaling up, you're saving like 3% and then it's extremely stressful and you have to figure out every little bit of the property. I just, I like to remove myself from it and just put some local knowledge on it. And then if you can get a mom or <laughs> some kind of acquisition disposition manager to manage those realtors, you won't even have to worry about your deals at all. So I started out in the business doing Facebook stuff, but it's just not worth your time. It's not even worth your time to do for sale by owner. So every single listing we have on the market right now is listed by a realtor. And I think we have 26 properties on the market right now. So I can't imagine trying to sell that on my own. So let's talk about fixing bottlenecks with seller leads. Your goal should be to contact every seller lead on time and try to convert those leads. You want to stay efficient. You want to make sure everybody's getting on the phone in a quick time. So the first thing you need to do is you need to organize your CRM. You need to systematize it and you need to build SOPs around that. You need to make sure somebody else can operate it. You need to make sure they understand every bit of the seller's stages so that it can be operated by a team. Sure, you can keep it unorganized when it's just you, but when you have a team, this needs to be organized. If it's unorganized, unorganized stuff will slip through the cracks. And then you need to hire an acquisition manager. I've dabbled in, in hiring a little bit. I made the mistake of hiring like my fourth interview in the beginning, and he just turned out to not be a great employee. So next time around hiring, I really focused on the hiring process. I approached it like an engineering company would approach hiring. I asked good questions. I interviewed a lot of people and my faith in like Filipino VAs went up. So I recommend you go after uh, somebody with five years or more uh, experience in sales, specifically like US sales people. Um, my first acquisitions manager, who's basically an operations manager at this point, he um, worked for a wholesaling company. So I do like the wholesale um, background. And when they go into land, it's just a lot easier for them. And they're just, they're really good with people on the phone, especially US people. And then train that employee. Um, first, the first hire is always the hardest just because you have to build the material around it. You need to film your videos and you know, you're just spending direct time with them. But as you add more people onto the business, you'll realize that if you made a good hire originally, your next hires can be trained by that VA. So that's something I never really thought about. When I doubled my team back in September, like I didn't really have to talk to them that much. My, my team was able to handle the onboarding process. So your first hire is always the hardest. From there, it's pretty easy. Just make sure you, you build your SOPs, make sure you're filming everything in case somebody leaves. So now I'm gonna talk about market selection. I know a lot of you guys are curious about land insights. I'll get into that too. Market selection was probably the toughest part for me when I started my business. I'm an engineer, I'm over analytical. I'm sure a lot of you guys are also over analytical and you need to break out of that and you need systems in place to break out of that. And the biggest struggle was that it directly affected my day-to-day -day work you're not outputting your marketing, your business suffers. And basically market selection should be your, um, your place in the business. You shouldn't be hiring somebody to do, to do your market selection until you're really scaled up and they're very experienced. So before I get into how I solved it, I wanna bring up the three types of land investors when it comes to marketing. There's the overthinker, the ones stuck in analysis paralysis. <laughs> That was me, that was me. I was, I was an overthinker in the beginning. Basically these people are on Redfin, Zillow. They're on the, maybe the map feature, zooming in and out, in and out. No clear direction of what market they wanna go after. No clear understanding of what makes a good land investing market. And they just dive way too deep and they can't hit their marketing numbers. They, they set a monthly goal and they can't hit it. And that was me, I would set a monthly goal and I wouldn't even hit it. And I wouldn't even try to just push it out. I was just, I was too nervous. I didn't want to waste the money. Now there's the interpreter and the interpreter is kind of like the in-betweener. They understand how the business works. They understand they need marketing in order to make money, but they're also still kind of stuck 
in uh, the overthinker mentality. These people are generally making like ten to twenty thousand dollars a month. They're probably cranking out maybe eight thousand mailers a month, uh, but they don't know how to jump to that next scale. Now there's the risk taker. The risk taker is the gambler. My favorite example of a risk taker is Mayor Shemtov. I don't know if a lot of you guys know. Huh? He's coming tomorrow. If you meet him, like he's, he's a really cool guy to talk to. He lives right down the street with me. We get lunch all the time. The risk takers win every time. These are the most successful people in the business. Yeah, any business. Yeah. So this was, this was difficult for me to jump out of. Like it was, it was di it difficult for me to jump from overthinker to risk taker just because I was always involved with data and I wanted data to back all my decisions. But I had to break out of that mentality and ultimately build somewhat of a in-betweener of the interpreter and the risk taker. So ultimately, I want you guys at the end of this presentation to be a mixture of the interpreter and the risk taker when it comes to market selection. So to fix this goal, fix this bottleneck with market selection, your goal should be to hit your marketing numbers while maintaining high quality demand markets. And this can be hard scaling. 40,000 new records a month, you probably only get like a thousand, I say 500 to a thousand records per county you work in. So you have to up like the amount of counties you're going after. I have to go to 40 to 50 new markets a month. And that can be tough. And the way you analyze markets needs to be understood. You need to understand the basic fundamentals of a high demand market. You need to start looking into sell through rates. We coined this term in Leah. Basically, like the number of properties sold divided by the number currently listed on the market. You need to be looking at these numbers and you need to be comparing them to other counties in a state. And you need to be ranking them amongst each other. So once you understand sell through rates, once you understand the top level demand of a market, you can jump into a single layered or a single multi-layered process for market selection. And I just push that into like the assembly line methodology. I just create an assembly line for my market selection in Trello. And then four, you need to hit your weekly marketing goals. So if you have a monthly marketing goal of 10,000, I recommend you break that down into a weekly goal of 2,500. And if you can't hit your weekly goals, if, if you're in your process of market selection and you haven't chosen enough markets, just be, be a risk taker and get that mail out. Ultimately, what builds your business is just pushing marketing. That is the catalyst for growth. So always hit those numbers. The best we can do is try our best and, and choose decent markets. So this is my market selection process. I turned it into an assembly line. The first thing I do is on the monthly basis, I'll aggregate a list of counties that, of my choice. So last year, Sumner and I hired a couple of VAs to build out a list of, I think like 200 or 300 counties in the US. And we broke it down by acreage and looked at the quantities for sale, pending and sold. And we could see from a top level what that demand was for each county. Now this cost us like a thousand bucks a month and it was hard to manage that team. So we thought, this is kind of where, where Land Insights started. We thought, could we just get every single one in the US? We thought about bringing together an army of VAs, which, which amped me up a little bit, but, <laughs> <laughs> but I knew a lot of people that could, that could help us out. And we built a team to create Land Insights, which tracks 2,800 counties in the US. 88 data points are updated per month, per county. So over a quarter million data points for land specific markets are updated on a monthly basis. And we just offer that at $500 a month. So you could do it with a VA or you could do it with us at 500. It's up to you. Now, the second thing we do is we select several markets in a specific state uh, that has high turnover rates. So I will choose a specific state, like I'll choose North Carolina and I'll butt up several counties against each other. I'll set criteria for volume. I'll set criteria for sell through rates and I'll choose a handful that, that stand out to me. Add that to my Trello board, goes through the system in the Trello board, pull up my county. I'll start taking notes on it. I'll pull up each county in Zillow. I'll pull it up in Redfin. I'll look at specific comps that sold 
that were listed correctly. They have good drone photos. They have they were listed at a good price per acre. Look at those, go down, scroll, and look at how long it took for those to sell. So if I'm seeing, you know, one to three month sales consistently in that county, checks off my box. I think it's a good market. So I'll usually push it to the next part of the Trello board. And the next part of the Trello board is just identifying any areas that are horrible. So we already know that it is a high turnover market, but there are areas that are turning over even better than others. So we usually kind of pull up the map feature on Redfin or Zillow and, and look at where uh, kind of the heat map of sales is going on and we'll, we'll choose those sub regions. So with, with most counties, we get 500 to 1,000 records out of that. So you need to really pump up your Trello and have a lot of counties that you're looking at and then find your sub-regions. Then after... Step four. Yeah, step, step four. Yeah. So step five is just choose the acreage range you want to go after. So I like to only go after big acreage. I don't really mess with infills. Michael messes with infills. I just think it's uh, a little too difficult to underwrite these deals because... You could have a deal that's not buildable, whereas you can have 10 acres that you know is going to be buildable at some point. So I usually go after a bigger acreage. So that being said, that's my market selection process. Now I want to bring up Land Insights. I know a lot of you guys are, are curious about it. So Land Insights, again, is that 2,800 plus counties uh, sales data updated on the monthly basis. Yeah, if you guys are curious about it, talk to the people that raise their hand too. I'm sure they'll, they'll have some good insight on how it works. So our motto is taking the land business out of the stone age. The land business is like, there's no clear, um, there's no clear research on how these markets are turning over. There's lots of like real estate housing data platforms, but nothing for land. There's, there's no way we can track what's going on in these land markets. So we're uneducated in terms of how these land markets are performing. So that's where we come in. We help with the research process and we help with just guiding your mailers and, and making a clear market selection process. So on the right here, this is a screenshot of one of our, one of our heat map features. We have a quarter million data points and we've organized these in several data tables and several heat maps to look at you know pending heat maps, look at sales heat maps. And you can see here, Stanley County, North Carolina, we have a pending sell through rate of 22%. So let's say there's 100 properties currently listed for sale. 22 of them are currently pending, uh, but that's not the case in, in the year. That's just a percentage. Six months sell through rate. So over six months, 106% of the inventory is turning over that's currently listed. We have the quantity of out of state owners that are there and then the quantity that are currently available. So we can see both volume and demand in that market in a heat map, which is pretty cool. And again, there's 88 data points per county updated monthly. So we break it up by multiple acreage ranges. So we don't want to just track one big acreage range. We want to track multiple so you can kind of gear it towards your business model. So if you like five to 10 acres, you can look at the data for five to 10 acres. Now, with this uh, platform, you have the ability to customize your tables. So we have a quarter million data points, but you can just adjust it how you like. You can delete columns you don't like. You can filter it ascending, descending. You can set criteria for how many properties you want available. So let's say you want to go after a market that has between 20 and 100 properties available. You can simply just put that in our platform and you can only look at those markets. So the advantages of Land Insights, one that I didn't really think about, but it totally makes sense, is faster dispositions. So we started doing a lot more expensive deals over the last three months. And we literally had two properties in the same market that I chose from Land Insights sell within, I want to say a week. And these properties were worth over $200,000. So we had multiple offers on $200,000 properties and they sold within a week. So I'm seeing extremely fast dispositions and it just kind of backs that data centric approach with uh, front, front loading your market research. And then, of course, you have a clear market research process. You have that single multi-layered process, and you don't want to steer away from that. And if you, as long as you don't steer away from that, you're going to get a lot more time back in your business that you can spend on more important things. It's not all about market selection. You need to build a team. You need to figure out capital. 
there's tons of places you need to be spending your time. So if you're spending a majority of your time on this, you need to figure this out and, and build out your process. And then the last thing, you have the ability to uh, see shifting land markets before anyone else can. So this just keeps you as an educated land investor. So I know a few, got, few of you guys received the email that we sent out uh, last week. We're opening 25 seats next week. If you're interested, you can head over to our website, landinsights.co and join the wait list. And if you join the wait list, you'll receive a course that I just filmed on my market selection process, more in depth, sharing my screen. You'll receive that for free. So if you guys want to check it out, join the wait list and uh, we'll send you over that, that course. Yeah, over a hundred people in a day, <laughs> crazy. All right, that's all I have for you. Any questions? Thanks, Ryan. I think this is most uh, detailed flow chart that I've, I've ever seen. I'm just wondering if you can share the, your slides within the Leon program. Yeah, 100%. I'll be uploaded inside Leon. Okay, great, great. Yeah. Questions? All right, we'll come over there. It's a journey, man. It's far. I think that worked out. Sheesh. So, Ryan, you mentioned, uh, you mentioned, mentioned using Zaps, using Trello. Um, are you using Pebble? Uh, Pebble? Are you utilizing the kind of framework we saw from, from Jesse and Kevin? And um, what do you think about all that? I haven't switched over yet just because I started my business back in 2020. Um, so I'm, I'm still using Follow-Up Boss. I'll maybe consider going over to Pebble. I just haven't had the time to you know, reevaluate how all my stages work. So it's on the horizon for you? What's that? Is it on the horizon for you? Yeah, it's on the horizon for sure. Okay. Yeah. Hey, uh, how are you pulling the out-of-state owner stat? You have, a, you have a statistic for out-of-state owners? Yeah, so out-of-state landowners, people with mailing addresses located out of the state. How are you pulling that? That comes from um, PropStream. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. yeah, you can pull it from LandVision too. Yeah. Uh, can you talk about your pricing process? So you said you do blind, I mean, the neutral and range. So can you talk about that a little bit? And then also like when you have your acquisition guys give an offer and you're willing to close on it, like what percentage is that typically at? Yeah, so it really depends on the deal. Let me just first over go over the, the pricing stuff. So if we're confident on a market, if we've already worked there before, we'll go ahead and send a blind offer because we know what it's going to sell at. We know what we can acquire it at. But in like new markets, we'll send a range and those ranges are pretty big. Like sometimes it's 30 to $70,000 and this just qualifies a lead pretty early on. So if they're interested in that range, then we'll like work them and, and actually come up with a, a legit offer. But we, what we've been doing with texting is we don't even have a range offer to start with. We'll just text them. If they ask for an offer, I'll have one of my team members put it into the spreadsheet. And then one of our guys actually creates a range for that specific property. And then we send it off. Um, and if they accept it, we'll come up with a, a bigger offer or a, a, yeah. Typically, you know, what offers are you, or what percentages are you moving forward at? So like, will you tell your team like, Hey, we're not going to buy anything at 60 cents, more than 60 cents on the dollar. Or like, how do you make that decision? So we have multiple approaches. So I like to do as many deals as possible. Like what makes the business turn is when you have equity in multiple deals. So I'll usually self fund something if we're making if, if we're under 50% of value. Otherwise, I'll look into deal funding or I'll do a double close. So as long as we're making $10,000 on the deal, that's kind of my buy box. So even like a, like a like $100,000 to $130,000, if that's our margin, we'll still probably do it because we're going to make at least 10 grand on it. Yeah, but like in that case, we'll probably do a double close. Yeah. One thing that I will say, I, I see this as a commonality with land investors, like they want perfect pricing. And I think the value of pricing, like Ryan said, is just a pre-qualification with the seller, right? That's why neutral letters are a shit ton of work. And, and in a way, it's kind of the best strategy because you get the most leads and you have a huge acquisition team, you can make it work. Um, but you're looking for accuracy, not perfection, right? And so you just have to be right enough to pre-qualify them, hopefully not waste your team's time. 
the magic happens in talking the leads, negotiating the leads, the acquisition process entirely. But like your team has finite time. So you can't just throw 10,000 leads at them a week that aren't pre-qualified, right? Yeah. Questions? Best markets, dead markets. I think it was one of your last slides. What are some of the characteristics to look for to get once you get from sell through rates, pending actives, you know that at the county level down to when you get to zip code or subdivisions, what are the things to watch for? <laughs> so usually the first dead market I get rid of is like mountainous regions. So if we're somewhere in the South or somewhere like near Tennessee, you'll see like farmland that's kind of flat in the valleys. And then you'll see the stuff in the mountains that's super steep. We'll usually get rid of that stuff because I just hate steep land. And the data will back that. If you're looking at like a heat map on Redfin of sales, you're going to see most of that stuff going on in the, the valleys, whereas most of the property sitting on the market is up in the mountains. So I just kind of avoid that stuff. That's, that's kind of usually what I remove. And then you'll also see just in Redfin, some corners of the county aren't trading over. Maybe it's just a bad spot or there's too many listings. Yeah, follow the dots. Yeah. If you guys want to see something funny for everyone that was at the hike last night, <laughs> my girlfriend's car got left there. We couldn't start it. It's literally getting dropped off in front of the event right now. <laughs> it's pretty funny. Um, do one thing that I look for in dead markets, like sell through rate doesn't tell you everything, right? For me, I hate oversupply. So we have to get eyeballs on our listing, right? There's definitely like an internet marketing component to what we do. So if I see a subdivision or fill in the blank, whatever it is that has oodles and oodles of listings, I'm out. Even the sell through rate strong. I just don't want to bother with it. You just get lost in the shuffle quickly, right? I love being in markets where it's like, I mean, it's hard to say for a subdivision can range so much and even counties can range wildly based on the size of the county. But I always talk about for the counties that I love are magic counties, 50 to 250 properties in active inventory. I love 20 plus percent sell through rates on a monthly basis. And you can apply that somewhat on a micro scale. It's still going to range a lot. But if you see dozens of listings in a subdivision or a zip code even, and they're not moving. That's one of the other things I do. When I'm looking at a market, I go to whatever, page five, the last page of listings. What is the oldest listing that's available right now? Is there stuff that's been out for 900 days? Okay, cool. If there is, there's something materially wrong with it. Is it landlocked in a flood zone? If it's not, I don't really want to bother with it. I don't like stuff like that, right? I think the hardest thing that we have to deal with in this business, I'll tell you what I think. Actually, no, before I say that, what do you guys think the hardest part of this business is? Anyone have any ideas? Selling the property? Anyone? Well, that's a personal problem. <laughs> um, yeah? Pricing, okay. It's a skill you can develop. I think, true. Kyle. Yeah, and I think that ties into the selling of the property. Boy, I hate dispositions because I have really no control over it. And so like top of funnel is picking better markets and then being really, really strict with where we say yes to buying land. I mean, our marketing costs remain constant no matter what market you're going in. And when I have a property that is tough to sell, the strain it puts on my team and me mentally, like this gosh darn Joshua Tree property we have, this thing, we're, we're not making any money on it. And yet it sucks up five hours a week of my team's time. I hate that stuff, right? And so there's some stuff you can do on the disposition side. Clint, you're pretty bullish, or I think you at one point were really bullish on the marketing on the, the disposition side. That stuff works, but it's still somewhat out of our control. What I do have control is what markets I say yes or no to, right? Any more questions? Yeah. Uh, what, kind of, what kind of money do you spend a month on marketing total? So, <laughs> yeah, the, the return on ad spend is just ridiculous. Like, I don't even need to show you those numbers. What, what is your ROAS, Rylan, if you had to yeah. guess? So, 15,000 letters is like 7,500, eight grand, like yeah. 7,500, eight grand. Yeah. Who is that? <laughs> <laughs> so you spend $7,500 to make $80,000. Like yeah, that's a no brainer. It's, it's, we consistently see if you have your team structured appropriately and there's some level of skill with your team, 10 X row S is pretty damn consistent. Now month to month, it can arrange a ton. Some months our mailers just flop. I'm like, do I know anything? But if I zoom out on a macro scale, yeah, 10 X ROAS is pretty consistent annually. So that's, that's, that's what keeps me in the game. If you can find a better business with a better ROAS, I'll probably be doing that, but I love that. Anyways. Yeah. All right. You already, you already asked a question, man. <laughs> Make me come all the way back. Hold on. Um, is I'll actually fall into this trap of like, uh, 
not overthinking, but having all this volume to look at, all these different counties to look at. How do you control um, just kind of selecting certain counties and sticking to them, dedicating yourself to them rather than just kind of shotgunning all over the, the country and, and not feeling like you're confident in the mail you're sending? Is that <laughs> Yeah, probably. I like this. So I like to set a criteria first. So we have like our right side filters page. So I don't like to go after anything that's under 300 available listings. And I don't like to go after anything that's under like 40 available listings. So I instantly set that criteria. If we have under 40, you don't really know the comps and there's not going to be a lot of comps out there because there's just not a lot of action. So when we're like between 40 and 300, there's enough comps to come with, come up with offers. Um, so I first do that. I set my criteria and then I'll, I'll individually look at a single state at a time. So I'll spend the whole day looking at like two, two different states and I'm only going to compare and contrast the counties within each state that gives you like a, a simpler view. And when you start looking at sell through rates, like half of them are going to instantly be bad. So you can narrow down that list pretty quickly. And ultimately you'll be looking at probably like 15, 15 counties per state once you set your criteria. So just, just mess with the filters, delete columns you don't care about and simplify that, that view. Cause looking at a spreadsheet with a bunch of numbers can be a lot. No, no. Yeah. Yeah, that's on all acreage. Yeah. Questions? Yeah. 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 In regards to neutral offers, uh, because you have to be mindful of certain keywords that carriers don't prefer, mm -hmm. are you prompting for a number that the seller is looking for? And are you able to get that in the first response or do you have to dig in a little bit? So this is how it works. Our first text is, hey, we, we see you on land here. Are you interested in selling it? But we have to word it all weird with all the <laughs> negative keywords. <laughs> We'd like to procure. <laughs> We'd like to procure your land. <laughs> people are like, what is procure? <laughs> West Virginia people are freaking out. <laughs> um, so then we come back with, uh, well, they say yes or no. It's usually yes or no or F off. Um, when they say yes, we're like, okay, did you have a price in mind or can we send you a range or a, can we send you an offer? And they'll say like, yes, or they'll send us an, like what they're looking for. And then they get added and we send the range. Yeah. Yeah. We keep it under like four texts. Yeah. Before they get pushed to a CRM. Yeah. Uh, that's land insights. Does that have to go big enough so that you can see how markets perform at different times during the year? Yeah, so that's growing over time. We launched in August. So we have uh, data going back all the way to August. And then Land Insights tracks all the way up to 12 months. So like this month's data tracks live from the last 12 months. So we'll well, once we hit the 12 month period, like a full calendar year with this, you'll be able to go back and say, hey, what was the data like in January of 2023, whatever it may be? Yeah. yeah, so soon we'll be able to- It takes a while. Track seasonality, which is pretty cool. And one thing to note too, uh, there's two cool things that we've been working on with Land Insights. One is doing what we've done for counties for all the zip codes in the US. That's a lot of data, like millions of data points. We've actually had to trim down some of the acreage filters to stack on top of it because it just gets insane. We have like people in their dorm rooms with laptops, like running scripts all night to make this happen. It's, it's a pretty ridiculous operation behind the scenes. And then we're adding a, a pricing function too. So tracking like median price points uh, within markets. It's not going to solve pricing. Like I'm not trying to be the next price and like give you answers that may or may not be reliable. Um, but I want to like take a complex data set and just make it digestible. And then you can infer from that what you want. You know, any more questions? What do you guys think about zip code pricing? I think it can work. I mean, like zip codes range wildly. And so, and they're arbitrary, right? Like, like subdivisions, it's going to be more of a confined space. You can have some zip codes that it's like half of it's a valley, half of it's a mountain. You know, it's just really hard to say. I think if you're more in like the rural infill stuff, like what Mike does or infill lots, I think it can be a little more reliable. If you're doing like what Ryland and I do, it's not that helpful, honestly. It's okay. It's just, it's just, they can be. It's just not like a, a dead on every time this is gonna work. You know, if, if I wanna find accurate pricing, I say, hey, I wanna buy 
20 to 40 acre properties and I go find shitty little subdivisions in the Southwest, pricing is going to be super easy, super, super accurate. Not going to be the same if I go and find zip codes in the Southwest and try to do the same thing. So I think like all the stuff that we talk about between subdivisions, polygons, uh, acreage ranges, like they all have a time and a place and zip codes do fit into that kind of on the polygon side. Um, I think the best thing is to kind of overlap these things, but it's not like a dead on every time it's going to work. You know what I mean? And I think I like the, the strategies that you use for selecting markets range based off of what kind of like subtype of land you want to go after. And that's why I think it's so important for you as land investors. Like one of the first things we do when people come into Leah is like, okay, choose your avatar. What identity do you want to be? Right. You can make money a lot of different ways in land. I've seen some of the craziest stuff and there's a lot of money to be made in a lot of different niches. But one of the things that's going to make your market selection easier and every other part of this business easier is saying, I just do this. Right. I just buy big properties. He buys big properties. Mike buys rural infill properties, like, like just knowing what you do. And that's going to limit a lot of the other noise, right? That's going to chop down what you're looking for substantially. So like just defining that's really helpful. Yeah. Questions? Yeah. Yeah. Well, let me, let me give you a mic. Hey, thanks. So on the uh, profit data that you shared and the um, kind of 10,000 minimum spread that you had mentioned, are you including closing costs or realtor fees in that? Or are those just purely purchase and sale differences? Yeah, that calculation was the take home profit before like investor splits. So yeah. with with uh, closing costs involved with realtor commissions as so well. Any, everything but cost of capital and any like operational costs in the business, but like yeah. closing costs, realtor fees, all that stuff. It's what we call like gross profit. Yeah. Uh, I saw, you have a question. You mentioned you have a, uh, a realtor outreach person. I'm just curious as I'm getting acclimated to talking to these folks, where in the process do you have them doing outreach? Is it once you get a market selected, you get a realtor teed up for when you actually acquire deals or do you have them reach out once the deal is acquired and what that conversation looks like? Yeah. So we usually do it after we get a contract signed and like if we don't know really what it's worth. Um, so that conversation goes along the lines of, uh, like it's, it's both an email and a phone call. So it'll be like, Hey, we're land investors. We're looking to build a relationship with you. And we do multiple deals in this County. Um, we'd like to work for you, work with you and, you know, grow a relationship. Um, would you be willing to look at this property for us? Yeah. One thing to add on to that, I used to poo poo realtors and then I'm like, well, maybe I should start using realtors. I took the wrong approach. How many people have been turned down by realtors? Oh, I don't comp properties. I don't look at property. Yeah. I've just come on more people than that. Really? That happens to me all the time. It's so like taking the angle of being relationship focused. And what that might mean is sometimes I will pay you to go look at the property or I will pay you to run comps, not because it's that valuable, but to build the relationship. And once you have good realtors, this isn't like rocket science. I think most people know this. They can be your boots on the ground and say, hey, this zip code or this part of the county, buy land here. And typically it's going to trade at this price. And like even with land insights, the tools that we have online, you don't get the real pulse on what's going on in the market. A realtor knows that, right? They can feel changes happening way before you're ever going to see them online. Like we are way behind the eight ball. So if you can have good realtors, man, it's a game changer. And good realtors typically know other good realtors. Like I've noticed that in Texas, we'll have one good realtor who's got another great realtor in the adjacent county, another one, another one. And so we just got like this daisy chain of great realtors. And because we sacked up and we paid him or we, we like were more long-term focused and weren't trying to jip him just for free comps, he's happy to refer us to other people. And what we do, I know a lot of people talk about this, but we actually do this. People talk about this, but it seems like they don't do it. We give them our dead leads. Right, Jordan, how much did that realtor make on that deal that we gave him? A little over $50,000 in commission from just a dead lead that we couldn't work. We just gave it to him. It's actually a crazy story. <laughs> we missed out on a $5 million payday on this lead. We'll have to talk about that another time. That's a really weird story. Um, but do that, man. You, you guys have so many dead leads. Give them to the realtor. It's a great way to barter. Any more questions? Yep. Uh, that was that was fucking awesome. I think everybody agrees based on the amount of cameras that were going taking all your pictures <laughs> of all those slides. But you said something a couple times, and I have no idea what it is. I might be the only one, but what are zaps? Z Z Zapier. That's how you say it? Zapier? So... I got not really, not many people know what a robotic process automation is, but it's like a back-end automation. So think of yourself of like, uh, 
Yeah, automated macro. So it does it without you manually doing it. So if somebody calls your Pat Live and they submit like a Google form submission, it automatically goes into your CRM. Like the computer automatically copies and pastes it instead of somebody manually looking at that and extract it. Yeah. Okay. No, that makes sense. All right. And one other thing, if, if, if land insights did not exist at your scale, how much would you pay for that right now? I'd pay over a thousand bucks a month. That's what we were doing. Um, me and Sumner and we were only getting like 300 counties. So it's definitely worth it in my opinion, just cause I, I build my process around that. If I'm looking at markets without data, I'm, I'm looking, I could be looking at a shitty market with, with horrible turnover. <laughs> Yeah, I did the math. It was like, yeah, if, if somebody did it, it'd be 4,800, assuming like, yeah. <laughs> and that's assuming maximum efficiency. Like these guys are just grinding it out. <laughs> yeah. So I, I actually had, um, I have one thing to say, guys, if you're going to call realtors, be sure you have PA signed. Don't call realtors and be like, Hey, give me a, you know, a quote on this property. And then they go out there and then they'll steal the property from you. It's happened before. So get your PA signed and then deal with all the other stuff later on. Don't worry about it. If you have to cancel, you have to cancel. It's in your contract. Just get your freaking PA signed. So make sure you're not calling realtors without that. Always just get the contract signed. It always blows my mind how many people are scared to get a contract signed. I'm like, dude, get the thing signed every time. What are you doing? Okay. Uh, questions? Man, Riley, you're getting all the questions today. Hold on. Candy stuff. What's your marketing cadence per county? So like how many times I go back to it? So... On new markets, I'll first text it. So I won't send mail before I text. So I first text it. If I do a deal there and I like it, I'll send my mail there. There's not really any cadence to it. And then markets that I have worked in before, I'll usually mail them on a quarterly basis. So like markets that I really like. No, same list. New letters, yeah. No, no. Yeah, just different, different, different yeah. text sent. Uh, I think there's like an opt-in feature. We haven't really noticed anything drop from our KPIs. We're still getting about the same amount of leads a day. Yeah. Are you removing the people that say that they're not interested from your mailer before you then send out your mailers? Yeah. Questions? Anyone? Got them all? All right, let's give it up for Ryland one more Thanks, time. Thanks, guys. Guys, here we go. Thank you.